a very special episode of Fairway to Heaven. This is a breaking news emergency podcast. My name is Sue Ann Hang, and with me is my partner in crime, my brother from another mother, Jerry Fultz. Now, we are part of the regular announced team for Live Golf, and we're coming to you live this week from the Live Promotions event in Abu Dhabi. Different rooms, same hotel, same crowd. <laughs> as it should be, <laughs> yes, as it should be. Same well, we recorded BS. an episode earlier this week and were set to push it out, but then we received some confirmation of perhaps hmm, some rumors that's been perhaps circulating around social media that turned out to be true. So take a wild guess as to who's going to join us on our interview this week on Tea Time. Yes, the Masters champion himself, John Rahm. Hey, John, welcome to the Live Golf family. So happy to have you with us. And thank you so much for your time. I'm sure you've been busy. Uh, so we're going to just go right into it. We're going to ask you all the hard questions here on Fairway to Heaven. Uh, I do have to ask you, you know, the, the only thing you've commented on in the past about Live was about the format. Have you changed your mind about that? And what have you seen about Live that made you perhaps think about coming over as an option? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, uh, there's been a bit of a, a change, right? Uh, there was a lot more about Live Golf that, that was really attractive to me and yeah, maybe the format was a setback in the in the past, but at the same time, there's a lot of positives to it as well, right? One of the things that a lot of players can mention is you don't have a, a wave weather difference, right? Where you can just simply get unlucky and you're out of contention for that tournament, right? It, it's part of game, I get it, but it's something you don't have to deal with anymore, right? So that is that part is it's a very nice aspect. Uh, the the team. The team is is what really made it for me, right? Uh, being able to be part of a team and represent a team and play for my teammates, with my teammates, and against my teammates is something that, to me, uh, has always been very, very special. And when you get a victory to share, it's always better to have a team to share it with, right? So uh, is what was the most attractive part. And, you know, when we started discussions, it gets to a point to where even though I'm ambitious, I'm not greedy. So this um this is a give and take, right? It's a give and take. And the format is something that you can I can easily overlook. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'll learn to enjoy it. I'll just have to get used to it, but I'm sure I'm, I'll learn to enjoy it. To be honest, the more I started thinking about it, the more I kind of started thinking about my college days that were three-day tournaments, 54 holes, and everybody warmed up together for the most part, right? So uh, it shouldn't be an environment I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, John, I'm going to ask you the toughest one of them all. Um, speaking of uh, the <laughs> format, uh, there's one guy that I'm sure is a huge fan of the format, and that's your caddy, Adam. How damn excited is he that you made this decision? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is he's going to have a lot more time at home, and we always joke. He either sends me texts or his wife sends me texts of him doing the most random things at home because he's just absolutely bored. Uh, and the first thing I told him today actually is, man, I'm sure your phone is blowing up and I just hope Randy, your wife doesn't kick you out of the house before February. Um, <laughs> you know, she's <laughs> funny. We always talk about them. Well, she's not used to having them at home, right? Which is obviously a great thing. There's two, two boys are 10 and 12 and they're going to have the dad around for uh, around a little bit longer. And uh, he's my biggest supporter. Adam is, is an amazing caddy and even better friend. And uh, he supported me every step of the way. So well, if, he, got, if he was severely against it, I can tell you this would have been a lot harder to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he was never going to be against it. But a quick follow up to that is now the things that matter to you most, and it's, it's you widely regarded, you talk about it all the time. Those who know you best talk about it all the time. It's playing great golf. You know, money uh, has never been a driving factor. Obviously, it was a huge factor in this decision, but it's never been a driving factor in your life and in your professional career. Does this schedule, much lighter schedule, you, you think give you a lot more time to be? Uh, dedicate a little more of your time to the things that really matter to you in life, being a good dad, being a good husband, being a, a, a great friend as well. Uh, it's it's a very clear schedule. That's what I love about it, right? It's actually a bigger stress than people would think for me, setting up a schedule and being able to organize it so you're trying to peak at the right times. You know, when the schedule is given to you, you adopt. It's one stress that's not really in my mind and, and go and play. So I do love that and having time off. 
is something I've always looked forward to, right? Uh, even in my six, seven year professional career, I really hadn't had that much long of a time off. In 2021, I decided to take it and it was very, very needed. Uh, but I had to give up playing certain tournaments and prize monies and bonuses, right? So even though I don't play for the money, like I've said, when it's earned, it's a little bit different. And to be able to to have that clarity is is incredibly, incredibly nice. Now, I must say, because this topic keeps coming up, yes, absolutely, the money is part of a discussion. I do not hit a golf shot throughout the year when I'm thinking about money, and I don't play the sport for the money, but as a husband, dad, dad, and a family man, it's a, I owe it to my family and my lineage to do what I can do best to set them up for success in the future. So yeah, it is a factor. I 100% respect that uh, all the way. Now, another thing that you, you know, you're passionate about and something that means a lot to you is the Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you, what were your reactions when you heard what Rory had said your thoughts on those comments, uh, and I'll read it out really quickly for those who, who might not have heard it. Yeah, he I said, mean, John is going to be in Beth Page in 2025. Because of this decision, the European Tour is going to have to rewrite the rules of Ryder Cup uh, eligibility. There's absolutely no question about that. I certainly want John Rahm on the next Ryder Cup team. You know, it's 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 amazing to hear. Uh I have the utmost respect for Rory McIlroy and to have his support right away is very, very special, right? Uh, it's it's almost emotional to hear about it. Uh, the Ryder Cup means a lot to me and is one of the things that made this, this decision very difficult for me. And I've always been hopeful that if I made the step, the DP World Tour would, uh, would maybe adapt the eligibility so we can play it. Um, with that said, I absolutely pretend to to keep my DP Walter status and PGA Tour status and and be a member if possible, if allowed and play in more events. So uh, nothing regarded to that is going to change in my mind. Uh, for those people that maybe have questions in Spain, I would say sort of me physically not being able to get there, expect to see me at the Spanish Open, right? I'll be there. Uh, and some of the other days that I would love to to be a part of, right? It's one of the great things about Live Golf that gives me that flexibility to go play some other events uh so yeah i'm hoping i'm hoping you know sooner than later we hear some news about the Ryder cup and we get a clear path of how we can make things work um i would love nothing more than to to defend the cup in, in beth page there there is a lot of uncertainty though in the golf landscape john moving forward especially as it concerns the the pga tour live golf with the dp world tour involved as well in those negotiations um, how do you see that landscape evolving? And do you think this decision um, that you made to come play live golf will perhaps expedite some of that evolution? The, the landscape of golf has changed so much in the last two years, hasn't it? There's much, so much going on that I just hope, whether it's me or not, really, I just hope in those discussions behind, behind closed doors, I really hope the game of golf, which is ultimately the team I'm on, the game of golf ends up in a better state, right? We all want to see the best players playing against the best players and have the best competition, the best product forward, right? So uh, I hope that's what happens. And if I'm a reason to why that's expedited, great. Uh, I certainly didn't set out to be, you know, the, that guy, but, uh, you know, be a true honor to represent that as well, even though I'm not alone because there's many other people that have abdicated for this and have made choices to push this forward really curious as to what the hell is your team name going to be and <laughs> if you're not going to give us the exact one maybe give us some options that you might be thinking about maybe jerry and i can help you out a little bit with that but also maybe who might be in that team that's what we all we want to know who's on the team the name's <laughs> gonna come i mean it's got to be matadors or el toro it's got to be but anyway who's gonna be on the team <laughs> i'm on the team and <laughs> next three spots are our TBD, and you'll you'll find out when uh, when we're ready to announce. Uh, regarding the team name, now I'm a little bit more stumped because I haven't been able to talk to people and get enough. Right, I haven't really talked to anybody about this. We actually had a meeting right before this just about that. So we're we're brainstorming the some names that we liked. Uh, my wife and I have been thinking about a couple. There's definitely some front runners, but with all that info, I bet the the creative team is going to come up with a couple new ones. Uh, but yeah, I never realized how much the team logo and the team name 
how difficult of a decision that was going to be. And <laughs> I'm here for it though. And listen, in social media, whoever is watching this, I'll I'm open to suggestions. I'm open to suggestions. Uh, I can imagine a lot of the names are going to be Spanish, Bo, or Matador uh, related, like most of the ones I've seen. But I would like people to maybe uh, think outside the box as well a little bit, right? I'm not the only Spanish player over there in Live Golf, so um, we'll see. We'll see what we come up with. How about Rambo? Uh, Rambo. Rambo. Rambo's. No, I wish, but it's a little taken already. Uh. <laughs> I was gonna say that would be like the perfect soundtrack and the perfect actor for it too. <laughs> oh, that would be perfect, perfect mascot, John. Now that there's still um, there's a lot of a lot of serious stuff still going on in the game of golf in the business. Um, there, you know that, that you were kind of almost emotional over those comments by by Rory. Now there's going to be a lot of comments that aren't quite that way, and uh, Graham McDowell. For one, said when at the very beginning, those he didn't handle them quite so well, and they kind of got to him a little bit. Some of the darts that get thrown your way because of all of the rhetoric that's out there, and and uh, and what happens when a disruptor comes into the game and uh, kind of rocks the boat a little bit. It's human nature to do that. How will you handle those types of comments and those types of words, or or will they affect you at all? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be the first time in my life I face some criticism. Let's be honest. So. Uh, the fact that I can say is I can I've leaned on my family a lot throughout all this and I will keep leaning on the family and friends that I have and they've all supported me throughout all of this right the people that truly know who I am fully support me and embrace it and that's who should matter the most to me right their opinion if you know if close people to me would start telling me hey maybe trade lightly might not be a good idea or think differently of me maybe I will question myself but throughout this case uh, I've had unanimous support, so uh, try to focus on that quite a bit. And the fact that I know when you make a decision or you have a goal or anything that just simply is a little bit outside of the norm, there's going to be people that don't understand it and criticize it right away, right? There's also going to be curious people that are going to try to understand why and maybe come out of, in a positive way. And then there'll definitely be people that are supported, right? So you're going to have a bit of everything. It's... It's just kind of what it is when you're in the public eye, right? And uh, especially nowadays, if you go down that Twitter or X wormhole on Instagram, you can find out your fair share of negativity. So um, I definitely won't be doing that. Yeah, I was going to say it's a pretty toxic uh, platform, those couple of spots. Um, all right. Well, finally, I'm sure you've seen the schedule for 2024. Uh, needless to say, we are going to Spain. Uh, but other than Spain... Are there any other locations that you're super excited about? Take a guess. Because there's one that stands out. Singapore. Come on. Close. I do want to Adelaide. Adelaide is the one that, seeing last year, seeing highlights, I was like, man, that golf course looks incredible. The vibe looks even better. Same with Singapore. That golf course looked spectacular. So uh, I've always wanted to play more on that side of the world, and, and I'm really looking forward to those two. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. Once again, welcome to the family. And uh, both Jerry and myself are very excited to watch you play next year thank on you. Live Golf. Thank you. All right, so how cool is it to talk to John Rahm? He doesn't he seem like he's just in like, I don't know, just, I mean, obviously he's going to be in a happy place because he made a decision mm -hmm. that's going to benefit his family for generations, but he just seems so at peace with everything. Absolutely. And it, it, he sounds like he's very happy with the decision that he's made uh, for many reasons. And, and you know, one thing that he said was about college golf and, you know, the team aspect. And, and I am really excited to see what team name he'll you know, actually come up with and the team colors and the team logo. That's pretty cool. It's part of the, the cool process of being a captain, I guess. I think talking to some of the guys playing, and I think they might have sold him on that format a little bit, because at first, when I first heard about it and first came to live, same time you did, it, it was obviously quite unusual because we're traditional. So all golf tournaments have always been the same, but seeing guys riding out in carts like they're in a, a Monday, you know, a Monday scramble or something, it, it just seemed a little odd. But they love the fact that there is no differential in tee times and weather. They love the fact that they get to hang out together at breakfast and at dinner, and all 48 guys are basically one big fraternity. And I think that part probably 
probably appeals to him as well by now. But anyway, hey, we got some stuff to get to, and he might be involved in this in the near future. John Ron, we got our first really big trade news coming down. Uh, kind of lit up social media the same day the Rom news lit up social media, and the fans are really into it. Harold Varner leaving the goats where it seemed like he was going to be forever, a natural goat, and he's going to the Yankees. He's going to go play for the four aces. <laughs> and in exchange, in exchange, well, not in exchange, Taylor Gooch also being traded away from Bubba Watts's range goats to Brooks Kepka's smash. There's got to be more to that than meets the eye. We don't know what goes on behind the scenes uh, from a from a compensation standpoint, but something's going on there. Matt Wolf finds, I think, the perfect home for him at the mm -hmm. uh, at the Goats with Bubba Watson and Peter Uline leaving the Four Aces to go play for the Goats. Interesting stuff. Well, well Jerry, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about uh, that whole Four Aces dynamic that's going to happen. You got Pep Perez and Harold Varner on the same team. Plus Patrick Reed, plus Dustin Johnson. Um, so uh, between Pat Perez and and HV three, I don't know if anyone can get a award in. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And uh, I mean, you get the the individual champion, and you trade him away. But in his place, you're getting a guy who is 24 years old, has all the talent in the world, has openly talked about his struggles with mental health, but. Bubba Watson has as well talked about his struggles mm -hmm. with mental health and they could, I don't know if they nurture each other, they relate to each other, they commiserate with, with each other, but there is no question in the world. Matthew Wolf has as much talent as anybody playing golf. And if Bubba can figure out a way to help him bring out the best in himself, uh, it might turn out to be one of the smartest moves ever in the, in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 2024 live golf season is shaping up to be quite an epic one so far. Well, now back to our regular programming. We recorded part of this show earlier this week. We discussed more about John Rahm. We talked about the live golf promotions happening this week in Abu Dhabi, the PGA tour, the rollback. And we even talked about NCAA football. It's an en entertaining episode to say the least. Take a listen. Gonna have to go with John Rom again, man. I mean, it's like it's <laughs> silly for us to not talk about that guy. I mean, he is our reigning ch Masters champion. There's been rumors and rumors and rumors about him coming over to live. Now, a few days ago, Tiger uh talked about it or touched on it very briefly at his press conference when he played at the hero. Um, and he was asked if the rumors surprised him. Obviously, you know, was asked without specific names whatsoever. A few names were dropped, however, Ram, Shoffley, Kentley. Now he said though, after his second round, um, hypothetically, would it surprise me? Yes, but there are so many different things that have happened in the last, as you said, 48 hours, but also in the last few weeks. Things have changed and will continue to change. Interesting, very yes. cryptic, very tiger. Very different than what we were hearing a year and a half ago, too. So much of the messaging coming from the players and out of Ponte Vedra is quite a bit different. And uh, hopefully that is a good sign for the coexistence of separate entities or coming together as one entity into the future. But we don't know that. I mean, Jordan Spieth, Swan, he had some uh, comments as well, didn't he? Absolutely. This is what he said. John Rahm is one of the biggest assets that we have on the PGA Tour. So it will be a really, really not very good for us in general because we want to play against the best players in the world. And that's what John is. I know there's been some guys that have talked to him. I know he's maybe weighing some decisions, maybe not. I really don't know. So I don't want to insult him and say he is weighing decisions if he already knows he is or he's not, you know, that's someone out of my control in a way. Obviously, I would speak on behalf of 200 plus PGA Tour players and saying that we really hope that he is continuing with us. That's what Spieth said. John Rahm is all about majors, and he likes playing against the best players in the world, too. Now, granted, the OWGR is obsolete and extinct and doesn't prove it that way the way it is, but we have guys who, before our first season started, 
were considered the best players in the world. And Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, Phil Mickelson was high at the time. So many young talents, including the recent winner, Waco Neiman, Abraham Anter. You got, uh, I'm, I'm missing a bunch here already at the top of my head, but we have a ton of world-class players, of the best players in the world. And that's proven in the limited sampling they had in 2023 and will continue to do so. Let's just hope there's a way they can get together more often and the, and the powers that be come together and figure out a way to do that. But I think the big question people are asking now is John Rahm, the tipping point. And is this the beginning of the end for the PGA Tour as we know it? Time will tell. We don't have those answers. We don't have much more insight, if any, than anybody else listening. But uh, it's a uh, changing. Times are changing. And I think this is going to lead to a, even a little bit faster change. Yeah, I, I think that's what's been said a lot, um, you know, just scrolling through the Internet. And a lot of people are saying that, you know, John Rahm is, is a guy of integrity and is, you know, he's he's a he's a people guy. Right. Everyone loves John Rahm. And so if he does move, is that a an indication of, of trouble on the other side? Perhaps. Who knows? We don't know. Well, above it, my pay grade, as I like to say, Jerry. Yeah. 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 You, you know, John, everybody who knows John Rahm and, and knows him personally and talks publicly about him, they all say kind of the same the same sentiment, and that is John Rahm doesn't care about money. He knows he's got enough already to last him and his family and probably a generation or more past that uh, for the rest of their lives. He cares about one thing and one thing only in terms of his professional career, and that is majors. Now, he's not, he, I mean, obviously money is a factor in every decision you make professionally, but I think there's a whole lot more substance to his decision to join Live than just the money. And I think a lot of it could be uh, maybe being a little more rested, maybe being a little more prepared, maybe being a little more focused on those majors, maybe being a little more of a dad sometimes, maybe being a little more of a best friend that he he claims that he works on all the time, being a, a better person, a better parent, and a better friend. And it could be, and I think a large part is a disillusionment with the leadership at the PGA Tour. And, uh, and um, I think uh, one of my topics to talk about in our shotgun star is exactly that. There's now a petition being thrown around by the what the, are being referred to as rank and file players, although I think everybody with a PGA Tour card or everybody who's a member of Live Golf and many other uh, worldwide tours are stars in the game in their own right. But they're being called the rank and file, not the top stars, not the not the eyeball turners. Um, that they want to have a meeting and get together uh, as a group with a collective voice to express their uh, unhappiness with the current the current format of the PJ Tour and where it's headed, rewarding the star players at the expense of the the uh, guys who are less heralded. Now, keep in mind those guys who are less heralded are making much more money in 2024 than they ever were going to make in 2021 and 2022 without Live. But everybody wants a bigger slice of the apple. And it just, to me, kind of sounds like a mutiny is building in Ponte Vedra. And now that the policy board has equal player votes to player direct to director's votes, independent director's votes, Jay Monahan is essentially neutered. He can't do anything. He can't make a decision without all of their approval, without the player's approval. And it's going to be slow going. Yeah. You know, I just listening to to different perspectives, perhaps, you know, there are people that are saying, well, those guys just need to play better. Um, you know, they need to find their way to the top, just like all the other players have. And that's why they are at the top, because they have played well, they have produced results. Um, and, and, and so that's why they're at the top. Um, what do you, I mean, I think, what's your take I on that? I think they feel, I think they feel that they're robbing from Peter to pay Paul. They're, they're taking away from the other events to subsidize the, the elevated events, the no cut events, um, mm -hmm. and, and reward the stars for essentially not joining live their stars for not joining live. Um, right. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I, I don't know if anything's going to come of it. I just know that there's a lot of people who are unhappy with the way things are going currently uh, on the other side of this equation. And and uh, I guess it's almost like bragging a little bit, sadly so, but uh, there's not a soul unhappy with the way things are going with Liv right now. And and it's going to be a fun ride for in the foreseeable future. And now it'll be really interesting to see if Rom's the only name coming. Obviously, there's more rumors out there and uh, and time will tell. But it's going to be really interesting to see uh, what happens in the next few weeks. And uh, we'll all be sitting by the edge of our seats. <laughs> I certainly already am. I mean, like, 
literally what's going to happen is John going to join Sergio's team? Is he going to I know, right? Go to Torque? Is he going to have his own? Is he bringing people over with him? I mean, question mark, he, question if, mark, question mark. <laughs> if he has his own, are we expanding to 14 or 13 teams or maybe 14 teams? You never know. What's Rom's team's going to be team going to be named if he has his own team? I don't Many know. Problems. I mean, that's a I don't matadors. Know. I like matadors. <laughs> I don't ah, know. That'd be awesome. Matador. I'm terrible. Maybe Swingleberries. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Faraday's team name. <laughs> that's Faraday's team name. Oh, he might he might just uh, you know charge a little copyright or something. Um. Anyways, with that said, obviously there's been some news about Tiger. He made his huge comeback since I don't know what it's been eight months since April, right? Yeah. Since he had his ankle yeah. surgery. Um, you know, he he did, you know, it wasn't a perfect comeback. Is any comeback really perfect? I mean, especially with his first event, but it's definitely better than we expected. At least I expected. Um, he averaged 305 off the tee, Jerry. Yeah. For a guy yeah. that's gone through what he's gone through, that's, well, that's you know still, what? He's poking it out there, man. We were sitting watching on the couch on Sunday at Hero um, and uh, Karen and I, and and I made the comment, I go, I don't know if Tiger's swing has ever looked better. Now, granted, there was a lot more power in the swing back in those early years, but I think now because of his physical limitations, it's, it's horrible to say that, but he does have physical limitations now, um, he is not able to go at it 1,000% like he used to, and it's under control, and he never, never ever seems to get out of sequence so from a pure fundamental standpoint his swing to me looks as pure as ever right now and the power is still there he's not going to hit it as far as bryson he's not going to hit it as far as so many guys on the pga tour and live golf and everywhere else but he hits it plenty far to do the damage he needs and i think the most important thing was seeing him walk 72 holes now granted albany's not a real hilly course it's got a slight bit of terrain not a ton um but the walk 72 holes seem to finish without a, a noticeable uh, limp or certainly any grimacing or pain. Um, so it, it leads it leads us all to be hopeful that he can play once a month, once his competitive season starts, which is basically just before Augusta, um, for five or six, maybe seven months. That would be great to see. That'd be great for golf. And, and like everybody said, Tiger doesn't move the needle. He is the needle. He's good for everybody, mm -hmm. not just not just the PJ Tour, but everybody else in the game of golf. And uh and I think we all just wish him the best. Will Tiger win again? That's a big ask. Will Tiger win another major? Even a bigger ask. But like David Faraday once famously said, the only time he's ever been wrong about Tiger Woods is when he underestimates him. Well, he had 19 birdies, Jerry. 15 bogeys, two double bogeys. Obviously a little rusty. as a little bit of, you know, inconsistency there. But he obviously is proving that he can play. He can compete. Like you said, walk 72 holes, even though it's not a hilly course. Still play a high competitive level, walk 72 holes with no pain in his ankle, no discomfort, completed four rounds of golf. That is really amazing. And he's going to tee it up next at the PNC in your hometown, Jerry, my old home yes. course, uh, the Ritz Carlton, right? Uh, with Charlie yep. for the fourth time, I believe, right? Oh, fourth wait. Uh, Ritz Carlton is a, yeah, I think it is. It's a Greg Norman design, just if anybody's listening. Yeah, just got to <laughs> throw wanna, a little pettiness in there. Wanna... <laughs> I got to get, you know, I'm not beyond the pettiness. I've heard it for a year and a half. I might as well throw a little in. But yeah, <laughs> it'll be great to see. Um, and that, you know, that is Tiger. That is Tiger's new major, actually. That's the one he's going to, and he has stated is the most important tournament to him. And 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 that's just showing that he has uh, life in a little better balance now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Jerry, you talked a little bit about the unhappiness yeah. uh, on the PGA Tour. Now, yeah. we're going to talk about a very specific player here uh, that's spoken about it quite publicly recently, Chris. Yeah, right? Chris, yeah, Chris, Chris Stroud from Houston, Texas. Yeah, one time winner on the PGA Tour who who did an interview with Rex Hoggard from Golf Channel. Rex Hoggard was still one of my better friends in the industry and a wonderful guy and a true journalist. If there is, if there, if there is such a thing left, it is him. He is a fantastic uh, journalist who, who takes his craft very, uh, very professionally and very seriously and doesn't cower to the, 
I don't know, the flavor of the day type of journalism that we see so often now in mainstream media and all of sports. But anyway, enough about Rex. This is about Chris Stroud, who said that <laughs> this uh, that the PGA Tour, he's never felt like they've ever done anything for him, that they've never done enough for them. He's never felt like they were on his side, paraphrasing his statements. And he is competing in the Live Golf promotions this week. And I, he was the first guy I ran into when I got into town. Uh, getting out of the elevator and uh, and he his hopes are high his hopes are really high and he told me the next morning that uh, ever since this came about he he thought it was cool he thought he wanted to be a part of it he's talked to so many guys out here and uh, and they tell him what the difference is from a lifestyle standpoint from the way they're treated from what the the competitive days are like from what the organization is like from all of the things that the players talk about that we get to see and we get to see them enjoy uh, and everything that leads to the fact that uh, live golf members lead all of professional golf and strokes gain smiling because it is a better way of life for their careers on live golf. And, and I think he desperately wants to be a part of it at this stage in his career. You know, he's not, he's, he's not on the upswing of his, of his uh, professional career. So it would be, it would be a really nice accomplishment to get that card for a year. And who knows if he got it for a year, he, you have to play great golf to keep it, but uh, he's got the game. He's proven it. And it seems like he's got the desire and the drive right now to really prove a point. And I think there'd be a lot more guys in his boat here competing this week in Abu Dhabi. If the PGA tour hadn't kind of did the end around and say, you can play, but at the very last minute. Actually, we don't want you to play, so we're going to threaten you with suspensions and fines for not getting a media release. So we didn't tell you about till two days after you needed it. Yeah, really classy. <laughs> very very, very passive-aggressive, Jerry, this evening. Yeah. Very passive-aggressive. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I think it's the no alcohol, right? I think it's a no alcohol that that's is. making it just bite. 30 just very, days. Wow. 30 days. <laughs> Doctor said, it's not that you shouldn't. He said, you can't with some of the medicines I'm taking from enough old people. They get sick. So old people get sick. Don't get old. It's okay. I love you. I love you older, whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. speaking of proving a point, how about our guys uh, playing well worldwide? Uh, you know, a lot of haters have said that live golf players are not competitive. They don't give a shit. They're this or that. Well, Here's to prove that uh, that is not true because Wahoo Neiman has had great two weeks in Australia. He just won. Um, now that's obviously with a playoff, right? He eagled the playoff hole to win. And Dean Burmester, second win in South Africa. Um, in a with row. A in a row with a stomach bug. He said he wasn't feeling well. He was vomiting. Uh, on the golf course, but was still able to pull it together. Uh, I was just uh, having a, a quick, you know, text with him, just making sure, just saying congratulations, making sure he's okay. He's doing fine now. Everything's fine. But uh, yes, Waco uh, won. Dean won. That's some fucking good golf, man. I mean, no, it's ex play we play scores. But we just play exhibition golf and live, and it's only 54 holes, and it's a shotgun start. It's a member guest. It doesn't count. And we have it doesn't music. doesn't matter. Why it's would you useless, love us? and they have music, <laughs> and people have a good time out there, and they don't fall asleep, and they get rowdy and have a blast. It's just it's an exhibition, Sue Ann. It's not real golf. Oh, yeah, but Brooks Kepka won, uh, finished second at the Masters and, and won the PGA uh, excuse me. Oh, and Phil too, by the way. Masters. Excuse me. Yeah, Phil finished second of the Masters. Yeah, it was Patrick yeah. Reed also finished up there at the Masters. Um, Burmester wins back to back at South Africa's oldest event, and then he wins the next week at the South Africa Open on the third longest course in the entire world. Wako Neiman beats a bunch of hometown favorites, especially in Minwoon Lee down at the Australian in Sydney, in seventy-four holes. So. Not 72. You can't play 72. He didn't win in 72. Nobody can win in 72. He won with a cut, isn't it? Wasn't there a cut? There was a cut. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. There was a cut. Yes. Too. Oh, my God. I mean, come on. You got to talk about the cut. Isn't it no like cuts. the whole fucking bee's knees? Anyways, uh, Neiman has qualified for the Open Championship. So, as Dean, congratulations to those two guys. Um, well, with the whole movement and the whole OWGR. Neiman's win projected to be 59th in the world, maybe yeah, still like outside yeah. chance of um, getting into the Masters, which I find it just quite tough to believe. You know, the Masters, they put out their their 
selection criteria a year in advance. They're the only ones who do that. The other majors uh, do it um, a little more subjectively throughout the year. Uh, it's not beyond them to give out a special exemption or two or three when it's warranted. And I think uh, with uh, John Rom news and maybe this being a tipping point of of a little uh, kumbaya between the powers that be, it might be the year that the Masters does the right thing. They don't react quickly to anything. But um, mm -hmm. if Walko Walk Neiman uh, doesn't deserve a spot in the Masters, I don't know who does. Uh, Dean Burmester has a great case for it as well. They both have qualified for the Open, but not the uh, but not the ma the Masters. Um, but I think when you talk about OWGR, I think they're moonlighting now, the members of that board, and not only in terms of negotiations with professional golf entities, but I think they're moonlighting with the uh, CFPC or CFPA, <laughs> College Football <laughs> Playoff Association, because I think many of the decisions that the OWGR has made make about as much sense as what the NCAA did to Florida State last week penalizing a team because of a hurt player, a team of what, I don't even know how many kids are on a college football team who persevered and won and did everything they could possibly do to give themselves a shot to play for a national championship and keep that dream alive. And they said, well, no, your, your quarterback broke his leg. So Alabama is actually a better team now. And they didn't let him prove it on the field. And that was the whole point of this four team playoff thing to begin with was to take the subjectivity out of the college football national championship. And sure enough, a bunch of wealthy older men got together in a room and decided, well, we know better than, than the players know. We know better than the coaches know the coaches pull at Florida state at third. We know better. And, Oh, and by the way, we'll probably get higher ratings with Alabama and Texas uh -huh. in there. It was just, it's, it's such a shitty, shitty decision. And every member of that board should be embarrassed of themselves. By the way, Jerry, I was very excited about this shotgun start when we had our show run down. I was like, yes, we're going to stir the pot. But you stirred it yourself. I was excited <laughs> to tee you up and get you all fired up and get you talking, just go on your rant. So <laughs> and the wrong with Fulty about <laughs> I don't know what you about NCAA, but you know, I'm going to speak for, I guess I, I personally don't watch NCAA because I just, we don't get it where I'm, I live in Singapore. We don't get football in general, American football. Um, but you know, I grew up in America. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but as a sport fan, if you have a team that have gone 13 and 0 won the conference, which is one of the top five the power hardest five. probably one of power the hardest five conference power five yes apparently one of the harder ones to, to win right um and you've just deprived them of going into the playoffs because why a quarterback's injured and you're going to deprive the entire team which by the way just in case we forgot football is a team sport it's a team sport. There's other players, there's offensive line, there's defensive line, not just a quarterback. So you're going to deprive the entire team of a chance of a lifetime for a playoff uh, to get into the playoffs because a player is injured. Hmm. Yeah, that's why they, um, but that's, that seems that's, like a that's very the... flawed um, system, if you ask me, just that's from the outside they... perspective. You said now, unfortunately, the ACC had a horrible record collectively this year, and that's the conference they're in. Um, and maybe that weighed into the subjective decision they made. But you play the games for a reason. The games have to matter. They went 13-0. and They were undefeated. Nobody's going to call Brian Harmon one of the four best golfers in the world, but he is champion golfer of the year. You have to give them a chance to continue to to persevere and to overachieve the way they did without their starting quarterback the last two games and especially against louisville with their third string quarterback didn't look great no but they fought it out they gutted it out they did what they need to do to win and last time i checked that is the reason so many parents get their kids into sports is to teach them life lessons is to teach them perseverance to teach them teamwork and to teach them collectively to bond together to learn how to win, to come out victorious. That's what they did, and they got shut out. Yeah, I mean, that's why they play the games, right? That's why they play the games during yeah. the season, to to earn their way into the playoff. And if it, if that's I, flawed, then I don't know what – I mean, I, I personally have – I don't know what to say. You know, it's just – it's I, I would – I feel for that team. I do, because that sucks. Yeah. That sucks for that chance to be taken away from them just because your quarterback's injured. 
Uh, that seems really sucky. All right. Anyways, enough about football. That's a goal. We're going to move along to our next segment called Forecast. We're going to look forward to what's happening this week, really. Um, We have to talk about the promotions event. That's why we're both in Abu Dhabi in separate rooms um, doing this podcast uh, for the first time in the same time zone. I have nicer cushions, to be fair. Oh, well, Third Wheel, our producer, made me move my cushions because he said they looked absolutely (laughs) hideous. I guess he was fine with them dancing around behind your ears, though. (laughs) Um, right. Well, we got some big names this week uh, that's been announced. Jason Duffner, Kyle Stanley, Jeff Overton, Chris Stroud, as you mentioned, uh, Martin, Zach. How do we say his name again? Bouchou? Uh, Bouchou? Bouchou. Bouchou. Zach Bouchou. Bouchou. Yeah. Kevin Chappell. Um, all the names that you're comfortable pronouncing, right? Um, and then don't oh, sure. take all the Thai guys. <laughs> We got you, of Dom, course, and Anthony um, Kang, and, and I am the uh, I'm the token Anglo. Yes, I like it. Um. Well, Zach Bosho, I hope we were saying his name right and doing it justice. Anyways, Hovland, uh, Victor Hovland, Boshu. caddied for him. Boshu, I'll get it right by the end of this week. All right. Um, Hoblin caddied for him the day after he won the memorial event in an U.S. Open qualifier. They're good friends. I believe they went to college together. Teammates, yeah. Teammates, Teammates, maybe okay. roommates, yeah. Yeah. So, um, look, I, I, we, we were not supposed to be rooting for anybody, really. But can I just put this out there that look, I, I, uh, if you couldn't tell, I'm Asian. Um, I kind of want some of the Asian tour guys to, 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 to contend to, to get those, well, they to will get those spots. Um, I think they will. Um, I mean, they're 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 good. They're really really good. Um, and they and they've have, been they, playing a lot of golf, and they've been playing yeah. good golf, by the way. They're really good. They've proven that throughout the world stage when they've had the opportunities. The the uh, Asian Tour is for a year and a half now, and I'm sure continue, will continue to be the the biggest winner in all the division that we've uh, seen in professional golf with the support of the PIF and Live along the way, and a lot more. Um, uh, good players, young players from across the world are making their way to Asian tour qualifying to try and get a chance to play in that international series and thus to try and get a chance to win the order of merit and play on live. That's a, a big dang, a big carrot to dangle in front of a lot of them. And that's going to continue to grow throughout the years. But th- these kids are good. They're really, really good. I watch mm-hmm. them play every time I get the chance when the, when the uh, European or the Asian tour coverage is on in America and uh, and they are good, and I think we'll see a lot of them contend. There aren't any, I mean, huge, massive star names in the golf world to the to the to the passive golf audience. But if you're a hardcore golf fan, you know how much talent's in this field, and and you're going to see three of them next year on the uh, on the Live Golf Tour. Now, rumor has it that uh, Siwon Kim, who had just a miserable year fighting the swing yips all year long, is starting to turn it around. I tell you, I, I know this. I've known the kid since he was a teenager playing in the U.S. Junior. Um, the kid can flat out play. And he had handled a miserable, miserable year better than anybody I know would have been able to handle how poorly he played and how he became the butt of so many jokes uh, on social media throughout golf fans. But uh, he's starting to turn it around. I wouldn't I wouldn't discount him. James Pyatt, I ran into on the mm-hmm. practice tee, and he is as focused as ever. Piot, as his first captain, Bubba Watson Piot. called him. Um, and just a great kid. <laughs> and a U.S. amateur champion, by the way. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot of good stories. I think more importantly, though, and you agree, you're going to be out there following the action. You're going to be doing the interviews with these guys who have life-changing moments on Sunday. Um I, I, I just think it's a really cool thing for Live Golf to be doing this. And I think it uh, it provides access and provides a, a hope for so many players to maybe get to be a part of this road show, this road carnival that we call a road show with the highest level golf you can possibly find anywhere and and test themselves against the best. And and who knows where that where could take their careers in the future, but it'll be a great learning experience for those who come up short as well. Yeah, I mean, look, not only are they going to have a spot on live and, and you know, the last episode, we talked about how much money they could make, even if they didn't play well during the season. Uh, but not only that, you know, they're going to be a part of a team for an entire season. And mind you, we have some pretty darn good 
captains, right? And and to be able to to hang out with them, to pick their brains, to to have them those players take them under their wings, coach them, guide them. Um, that's that in itself is just so valuable and and something that it, it's like life changing in its own ways. Um, and, and so it's, you know, yes, the money, of course, the opportunity, of course, but like to be able to play with your captain, with your team, be a part of that, and at the same time, compete with one of the strongest fields in golf. That is pretty fucking cool, if you ask me. Now, joining the names that you've already mentioned, Siwon Kim, James Pyatt, of course, we have Jediah Morgan, who's going to try and get his way back into live, um, hopefully get back on the Ripper team. Also, we do have Laurie Cantor. Let's not forget yes. Laurie Cantor, um, who played as a reserve uh, for live this season and last season. Very solid player. He won the qualifier this year, got into the Open Championship. Every time he is turned up to play as a reserve, he played Played well. He contributed every single time. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. single time. Very kind of an underrated player, I think. And one of the nicest guys I think I've met on Live this year. He's he's got he's very kind. He's very just generous with his time. He's very authentic. There's no air about that guy. So in some ways I am rooting for him. Uh but yeah, so much to look forward to this week. Um apparently this golf course, big Abu Dhabi golf club. Uh, we've seen it during the HSBC uh, men's golf um, on the it's European big. tour. It's big, but this it's, week it's, apparently the rough's not up. No, it's it's, uh, it's it's Bermuda past Palom kind of. It looks like more Bermuda than the past Palom. Past Palom's in the fairways on the greens. The rough looks a little Bermuda. It's just that height where you can catch uh, tiny flyers, but it's not going to be a big obstacle. It's a big golf course. I think they might be able to get to two of the four par five, certainly not all four. Um, it's not tight, but it's not a bomber's paradise. It's kind of strategic in that regard. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's extremely fair. There's not there's not a an unfair kind of design shot out there. Not a ton of contour in the greens. You're not going to hit a good shot that turns out making double bogey ever. It's going to be a great, it's a great qualifying test. So when you look at it, we got 60, what do we have? 61 guys round one qualifying one round of golf for 20 spots and ties that advanced to round two on Saturday will be round two. So that's basically a Monday qualifier in and of itself right there. Maybe two, three, could be four, could be one under, makes that cut to go on to the next day where you play, where you join 13 guys who have gotten a spot, uh, automatic exemption into round two. So between 33 and 40 players playing on Saturday and the low 20 that day, so your odds are a little better, the low 20 that day, exactly. So there might be a playoff for that 20th spot play on Sunday, 20 mm -hmm. guys, 36 holes, three three golden tickets on, on the line. So basically the way I equate it is you have two Monday qualifiers in a row followed by a U.S. Open sectional qualifying, and that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. a lot of I just like I literally had like sick to my stomach just hearing you say all oh, that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it really, you can have two hot rounds, right? Get through the, the first round, the second round, and just not have your best third round and you'll miss out, you know, and that yeah. that's kind of how it is. Right. I think the hottest yeah. partner is going to win um, or at least get their, their spots on live. Um, I think the hottest partner is going to win on Sunday, you know, uh, it seems yeah. like the obvious, but uh, got to make those putts, man, those five footers, 10 footers, 12 footers. Those handle, are the ones that will count. The nerves. It's gonna be it's gonna be good TV. It's gonna be really good yeah. TV on Sunday. I hope we <clears throat> hope we don't screw it up. I'm sure we will, but we'll try not to. Uh, we don't we well, don't have our guy Arlo here with us this week, so <laughs> you're, you're relying on me not to really pound it into the dirt. But uh, it's gonna be really good TV because there will be so much pressure. And you know, you talk about it. It is it's career changing for anybody, but it's mm -hmm. life changing for a lot of these young guys who you know didn't grow up with the utmost privilege and the, and the blue blood uh, kind of pedigrees and and access to the game and have dug it out of the dirt. It's gonna be it's gonna be a really cool moment. Well, in case you're wondering who is uh, going to be on the coverage, well, Jerry and Don Boulay, they're going to be in the booth this week. You're not going to hear Tweedle an dumb English... and Tweedle stupid. Yeah, well, you're not going to hear that EPL guy, you know, 
and that <laughs> Irish accent. Uh, uh, perhaps some voices you might be familiar with. But uh, yes, Jerry and Dom are going to be in the booth and I'm going to be on the golf course uh, along with a voice you might be quite familiar with if you do watch the Asian tour stuff, uh, Anthony Kang. So uh, it's going to be a really fun week. We've already had a session of beers and bonding. Uh, it's it's going to be good. All right, Jerry. Let's wrap up the show with our final round. And uh, look, I got to, fuck, I got to talk about it. Let's talk about the golf ball rollback. We had a conversation Uh. about this about an hour ago over some beers, you with some Pepsi soda thingy. Um, Give us your thoughts, man. Just, just what what do you think? Uh, You know, I think the ship has sailed. I think, uh, well, let me get my my alcohol of sobriety doesn't agree with me take out of the way first. Uh, make no mistake, <laughs> this is a bunch of predominantly wealthy old white men making this decision to protect their golf courses, most notably St. Andrews, the old course. Um, and I think it's about that course and that course only. Now, there are some classic courses in America where their members ha- are quite influential and quite wealthy and, and would like their courses to be relevant again in the major golf landscape. The fact is they're too short to be uh, relevant, even if they do roll back the golf ball. And the other fact is they don't have the room for the infrastructure that it takes to build a whole carnival city to host a major championship these days. Um, that that ship has sailed. You know, you, you think of something like the Myopia Hunt Club. Everybody uses that as an example. Hosted four U.S. Opens all before, I think, 1908 or something, 1914, twice when it was only a nine-hole course. Of course, of course, like that is not going to be relevant again. There are some classics I think a lot of people would like to see and and, and maybe return a little of the of the beauty of of a five iron into a par four or something. But the, the truth is, the game has evolved since it, since its very beginnings. Technology has evolved since the very beginning. Uh, the golf ball, uh, generation after generation, has gone farther. Maybe because of the technology of the golf ball. Maybe because of the technology of the clubs. But the one thing you can't doubt is because of the athleticism of the human being. All other sports where there are where there is no actual technological equipment or technology equipment involved. Let's go back to the most basic running. Running times get faster from miles to 100-yard dashes year after year, Olympics after Olympics. Humans get bigger, stronger, faster. I don't know if it's through evolution, through time, through better training, through everything that comes together to make an athlete what he is. Uh, but that is the nature of of, the, of human progress. Um, it happens in golf. Obviously, a lot of it's technology, but I don't think it's the golf ball. I think we miss the boat with the technology of the drivers and the driver head size and the and the reflex of it, the COR of it. And that's too expensive and would set up both the RNA and the USGA for really expensive lawsuits that they cannot and will not win or afford. They don't want to do that. The golf ball is a low-hanging fruit. It's an easy target, and it keeps a lot of influential wealthy men happy to be able to think that they're doing something to preserve the integrity of the game the integrity of the game the way i've always known it low score wins doesn't matter where you hit it doesn't matter where you play low score wins don't take the fun out of the game please don't take the fun out of the game for the average golfer or the golf fan watching professional golf but the average golfer everybody says oh they're a 15 20 handicap they won't know the difference doesn't matter what ball they play bullshit Bullshit. A, fit, a 20 handicapper hits a number of good shots each day. And when that golf ball comes down 5, 10, 12 yards shorter than it did last time, it's not going to be as much fun. Golf is in a boom right now, an absolute boom. Mm-hmm. And we're going to neuter it. Like, like uh, uh, just pisses me you off. You know, so. it's funny. I, just having that conversation with our colleagues, um, you know, before we got on this podcast, it was really interesting to, to kind of – listen to different perspectives, right? Everyone has a different perspective about this. Now, I'm almost indifferent, right? I, I mean, to me, I can I can sort of understand the different perspective and why some people might be against it and some might be for it. Let me ask you this. We've obviously seen an evolution of, of golf balls through the existence of the game, right? We went from... I call them mochi. I call them. I've called. I call them mochi balls um, because they're so soft. The baladas to to the, just through the years, and now we're where we're at. Us golfers, you know, the history of golf. Players have been able to 
move along with the advancement of the golf ball. Why would this be any different? Yeah, yeah. Fairways were an inch long and greens rolled at three, four, and five back in those days. It's a different game from an agronomy standpoint, too. Uh, they've talked about, you know, pros using 10 clubs. Bifurcation, which I, I didn't even know that was a word till they started talking about golf equipment years ago. Um, bifurcation is the easy answer. Rory and Tiger have both said bifurcation was the easy answer to have the pros play different equipment than the amateurs play. Um, looking, I mean, nobody wanted it when they floated that as a, as an idea a few years ago, the USGA and the RNA. And nobody wanted that. It was universally uh, panned and, and said, bad, bad idea. Change it for all or change it for none. Now they're going to change it for all. Uh, and and uh, or they have changed it for all, depending on when this uh, podcast hits the air, because I understand the announcement is coming any time. Um, and everybody thinks most people think it's a, a bad idea, whether they're against the change at all or the or the fact that they're changing it because the pros make some old courses obsolete. The amateurs aren't making those courses obsolete. Amateurs, the mm -hmm. USGA and RNA have had have had these campaigns for years about play it forward, enjoy the game where you shouldn't be playing where you're playing. And now you're going to take yardage away from them even still. It's just going to slow the game down and make it tougher. But uh, it's only for a select few players in the entire world, male players. This is not, and, and it's going to have a horrible effect on the, on the ladies' professional game because – it's just going to make them seem uh, physically inferior even more. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's unfortunate. There's not a, there's not a, a female that I know of anywhere who thinks this is a good idea for the female players recreational, recreationally or professionally, none, and there won't be any. So uh, you're talking about a tiny, tiny microscopic percentage of men who play the game at the very highest level uh, to protect a few dozen courses throughout the world that really aren't uh, ones that it's, it's just such a tiny, tiny sampling and a rule that's going to affect millions and millions of golfers. And that's sad. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. And I, I think, you know, uh, there's so much happening in the game, you know, uh, at this moment, um, so much other things that perhaps need work or perhaps need more attention um and and we're dialing back golf balls so i you know i don't know i haven't quite made up my mind about it yet whether i'm for it or against it um i do respect i guess everyone's sort of perspective you know from a manufacturer's perspective to a player's perspective to even uh, a major championship or a tournament perspective so i don't know it's really interesting and uh <laughs> Fuck, man, it's an interesting time in the game that we play. So um, anyways, that's a wrap for our second episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Do subscribe, leave a comment or two, and you can find us wherever you get your podcast. If you do want to watch us on TV and see our faces, well, you can check us out on the Live Golf YouTube channel as well as our streaming app, Live Golf Plus. We'll see you soon.